So a couple of years ago, I pick up the phone. I'm on a con- having a conversation with my glorious, mustachioed, Northern Irish mentor, John. And I said this, John, how do I know that I've done a good job here? How do I know that I can be successful? I mean, what does success even look like? How do people do this thing for years and years and years without it stretching out into some sort of insanity where we're doing the same thing over and over and over again and expecting a different result? And I won't do his accent because he might be listening. But he said, Sam, what would it look like for you to measure success in your work and life by this paradigm? Am I more in love with Jesus now than I was this time last year. And he said, I don't have the answers for you, mate, but maybe I can offer you the next set of questions. And this was a few years ago in a season where I was really struggling to figure out what it meant to be a worship pastor here in this congregation, in this place. So much of it felt really intangible. I couldn't figure out how I was going to get up here week after week and lead worship without it sort of like stretching out into eternity. Because the work that we do here The work that we do in worship is is quite a deep sowing and can be quite a painful waiting to see things grow. We only get 20 minutes of time and opportunity as a worship leader to try and invite everybody in this room on a journey with us. 20 minutes isn't a lot of time. Maybe maybe sometimes you guys feel like it's too long. Um, I apologize. But it can be painful to wait to see, God, what are you doing? What are you doing? I feel like I'm just singing these songs over and over and over again. I'm saying the same words. I'm inviting people to do the same thing again and again and again. But really, all of these questions were flying out of my insecurity about not being good enough or able to be successful. And John, who is one of the kindest people that I know, took those questions and modeled to, modeled to me something of what it might mean to be wise. He completely reshifted the paradigm I was operating out of and relocated the source of my energies and my questioning towards the love of Jesus. Suddenly, success was not measured in my ability to make things happen. And the center of my role, the kind of purpose of my role, found its fullness in the goal of ultimately loving Jesus more and in deeper ways. And I remember finishing that call and going, oh, yeah. Maybe I don't have the answers, but I think I've got the next set of questions. I think my paradigm has shifted towards one of wisdom. And so that begs this question for us in this moment. How do we become wise? How do we make that paradigm shift in our heads and our hearts and in our lives? And especially how do we do that in our current cultural moment? Well, As a team, we've come up with five uh, questions or a series of questions that we want to ask that move us towards that end, that move us towards that thing of wisdom. And we've put them together because we're Christians and we work for a church in a five-week sermon series, woo, based on the book of Proverbs. And I have the privilege of kicking us off this morning, which obviously means that they had a particular idea about who was the wisest amongst the preaching team or the opposite. And I needed the most amount of help and research to figure out what it meant to be wise. But over these next five weeks, we're going to be digging deeper into this really wonderful book of the Bible, journeying together towards greater wisdom and closer relationship with Jesus. Does that sound okay? Great. I'm an interactive preacher. I really like it when people say amen or yes, because it just means that I know that you're not asleep. Um, Or on your phone, TikTok is interesting, but um, no, I'm not judging because I can also do that. Anyway, the book of Proverbs is, is a book that makes up sort of a collection of books in the Bible that we call wisdom literature. It's one of the, uh, it's one of the conversations that the Bible is trying to have with us about wisdom. And the other books that are normally grouped together with it are Ecclesiastes. Is anyone, is anyone, is anyone's favorite book in the Bible, Ecclesiastes? We can all go to therapy together um, because it's my favorite book as well. And it starts like this vapor, vapor, everything is vapor. Basically, nothing means everything, everything is nothing. Isn't that a fun, cheery way to start a Sunday? But Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, Job, and Song of Songs. For today, we're going to just park Song of Songs. It's slightly different. Go read it. Enjoy that. Uh, But it's important to know that Proverbs contains just this one part of this whole conversation that uh, the Bible is trying to, is inviting us to join in with. 
And um, the Bible Project, they're a charity, uh, an organization out of Portland, Oregon in the States, helping people to engage with the Bible. I'd really recommend uh, their podcast and their app if you struggle to read the Bible like I did a few years ago, jumped in with their stuff, changed my life. They have these wonderful metaphors that help us understand the relationship between these books of the Bible, between these wisdom literature books. And they basically, they personify each book in a particular character, a particular person. And Proverbs, our focus for the next few weeks, is a, like a brilliant young woman. She's full of knowledge and all sorts of things about life, family relationships, uh, marriage, money, work, school, rest, sex, all of it, you name it, she knows about it. And she's been keenly observant about the pattern of how things work in the world and the wisdom that she's gained. And she's trying to invite us into seeing that pattern with her and live it out and walk it out together. And she has this sense of security and the basic coherence of how things work and she's trying to help us to see that. So Proverbs, brilliant young woman, helping us see the pattern of how things work in the world and inviting us to walk in it. And then Ecclesiastes is more like the middle-aged cynic He's been around the block a little bit. He's read Nietzsche and Plato and he's traveled the world and he's tasted the finer things and he knows they can't satisfy. And he wants to invite you to see that the pattern that Proverbs lays out isn't quite as simple or quite as coherent as maybe it seemed, that there are exceptions to the rules. He wants us to show, he wants to show us how to live in the light of those exceptions. So Proverbs, brilliant young woman, pattern of the world, come and walk in it. Ecclesiastes, There are exceptions to the rules of that pattern. Let's learn how to live into the flow of that. And then you have Job, who is like a wizened old man or woman, and they've actually lived it. They've lived through decades, and they've really seen things hit the fan. They've seen the absurdity that life can bring. They've endured suffering and hardship, and they've come to grips with that fabric of reality. And they want to invite us into a conversation about where true life really comes from, beyond the pattern in Proverbs and the cynic in Ecclesiastes. So each of these books builds upon one another. They don't actually go in chronological order in the Bible, but they do build upon each other in terms of understanding wisdom. So that's the context. Do we understand that? Brilliant young woman, middle-aged cynic, old wise person. Have we got that? Thank you. Amazing. So that's where we're sitting. And so for the next five weeks, I want us to imagine that we're at a coffee shop with the brilliant young woman. And we've got things to hear. And she's got things to tell us and for us to learn. So the book itself, broken up into a series of parts. First nine chapters are some speeches from a father to his son, endearing him towards seeking out wisdom in his life. In this uh, section, wisdom is personified as lady wisdom. And these chapters describe her characteristics and why she is someone you should listen to and whose way you should try and follow. We then have what are called the Solomonic uh, Proverbs. So Proverbs, small sentences, which is what Proverbs is usually famous for. The sort of short, sharp, two-sentence things that King Solomon uh, wrote a lot of. And then it ends with a series of songs kind of further describing Lady Wisdom and, um, and going a bit deeper into that. But the whole thing starts with this. If you have a Bible, feel free to take it out. We're going to be reading Proverbs 1, 1 through 7. It's going to come up on the Phil said this the other day, the Bible's in the sky. Quite liked that. That was fun. So the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance. For understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and the riddles of the wise, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So we're set up, we're saying, these are here to help us figure out how to live wisely in our lives. Hence the question, how do we become wise? Well, let's go to the book of Proverbs and we can begin that journey. But it is important for us to know what we're being invited to in, into is not the accumulation of more knowledge. It's not about getting more ideas. It's not about listening and accumulating more information. It's about moving into a way of being which is wise. And honestly, we don't need that much help accumulating information. I don't know about you, but um, we live in an information age. It's at our fingertips. You don't really even need to hold the information in your brain for that long unless you're studying for a test. And even then, you only need it for a short period of time. 
We have Google and YouTube right there, and you can have the news wake you up and put you immediately into that sense of anxiety and existential crisis as soon as you wake up in the morning. We don't need any more information. We have this kind of flow overload of, of, of information that we live with almost constantly, and that's the problem because information is fleeting. It can be good for today, but useless tomorrow. Does anyone here work in technology? You will know that there are things that were totally true five years ago that are entirely obsolete now because information is not something that always stays true with us. So what Proverbs is extending and inviting us uh, into is how to become wise beyond that fleeting information and into what is true for all time. What our brilliant young woman has identified as the pattern of good living is what the Hebrew Hebrews called chokmah. Can we say that together? Chokmah. You've got to get really deep in the throat. Chokmah. That was disgusting. That was so good. That was really beautiful. I hope online you said it even louder. That would be great. So chokmah is this Hebrew word. And, and, and what it means is kind of in essence, it's the universal law and principles that God has woven into the fabric of reality itself. We sort of thinking of it, think of it as a river kind of flowing and moving in a direction that we can either jump into and say yes, or we can try and swim against the current and say no. One of my hobbies, um, I'm not very good at it, so don't ask me to, to make anything for you, is woodworking. Um, I sit in my garden with a little ax and a little knife and I make wooden spoons. They're not great. I have one that survived. Every other one has broken or cracked, but I really love it. Anyway, that's by the by. But if you've ever worked with wood, you'll know that there's a grain that flows and goes in a direction. And you need to understand the direction that the grain is going in in order to work efficiently and well and come up with uh, an end with, with, with something that you've created that will last, that is sturdy, and will maintain itself for a long period of time. So that's what chokmah is like. It's sort of working with the grain rather than against it, entering into the flow and moving with it. We can look at some examples in the book of Proverbs where we can see how this kind of entering into this flow is actually really practical and useful, helping us reframe ourselves towards living wisdom. So Proverbs 26, verse 20. Without a fire, without a wood, a fire goes out. Without a gossip, a quarrel dies down. As charcoal to embers, as, charcoal to embers, as wood to fire, so is a quarrelsome person for kindling strife. The words of a gossip are like choice morsels. They go down to the inmost parts. So I've had an argument with somebody. I've come away annoyed. My natural response is I need to go and tell somebody how angry I am and how terrible that person is immediately. But wisdom says gossip is fuel to the fire of a quarrel and will only send it deeper. Wisdom invites me to reset my heart to what is ultimately good, which is reconciliation and love and mutual respect of one another. Quick note, Proverbs, as alluded to earlier, is a book that lays out the general guiding principles of how chokmah, wisdom, works. It doesn't list the exceptions. So it's not always going to work every single time. But as we travel this journey of Proverbs, we do have to be wary of that and keep our eyes open to it. So when we preach over the next couple of weeks, it's not about going, if you, it's not A plus B equals C. If you do this, then this will happen. But it is saying that generally speaking, if we're trying to move into the way of wisdom, you will move into the flow of where God is moving us. So how do we do this? Proverbs 1 verse 7 says, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now hear this, this phrase categorically does not mean terror. The way to become wise is not by being terrified of God. This phrase is used throughout the Bible and its simplest meaning is that is, is responding or listening to God with humility. Being able to listen to him and say, God, I'm going to trust that your way leads to the good life. I'm going to trust that your way is the way that I need to be walking, even when I cannot see it, even when the information that I have doesn't match up with the way you seem to be asking me to go. Even when I feel really good about this thing, but you've asked me to do something else. Am I going to listen humbly to the Lord? But we are sometimes afraid to listen to God. Am I right? 
Because we're worried that if we slow down long enough and be quiet long enough to hear his voice, all we're going to hear is judgment. We're worried that if we just kind of go, okay, God, I'm listening. We're going to hear, why did you do this the other day? I know about that. Why did you do that? This was a bad thing. You're a terrible person. I want to say this morning, that is not the voice of God and the heart of God. When we enter into silence and listening to him, what we actually receive is love. What we actually receive is grace. What we actually receive is the smile and the song of Jesus over our lives because he has paid for all the other stuff. And so how do we enter into wisdom? Well, we stop long enough to listen. Rather than accumulate more information about God, which can I just say for a moment, this moment right here, I'm giving you more information about God. That's a good thing. It is a good thing. However, it's not enough. It's not enough. We have to take these things and live them into some sort of practical way of going about our lives and our day to day and our moment to moment. Or we just come to God when we need something. So we just talk at him. Okay, Lord, I need this, 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 I need this. Cool, see you later, bye. I'll come back when you've answered. (laughs) But the truth is, if you're willing and courageous enough to enter into periods of silence before God, to really listen to him, to move out of the information overload overload and say, God, I don't know, but you do. Would you tell me? I promise you will begin you will begin a journey of hearing from God in a new way. And you will move into the chokmah, the wisdom of life, as he reframes and gives you new paradigms of how to live your life. Ruth Haley Barton's book, Invitation to Silence and Solitude, which I meant to bring with me to show you, but um, I'd really recommend this book. It changed my life and changed my relationship with God in such a powerful way. She writes this, if we are able to stay with our frustrations long enough and not give up, we may begin to suspect that the things that most need to be known and solved and figured out in our lives are not going to be discovered, solved, or figured out at the thinking level anyway. The things we most need to know, solve, and figure out will be heard at the listening level. That place within us where God's spirit witnesses with our spirit Here God speaks to us of things that cannot be understood through human wisdom or shuffled around and filed away in the mind. Spiritual discernment is given as pure gift in God's way, in God's time, beyond what the human mind can force. And so the beginning of wisdom is listening to God. I am running so far out of time, so I'm going to speed up a few things here. Here's a practice for us to do, to begin to to bring this into our lives, so that over the next five weeks, as we hear more, as we accumulate more information about God, we can take that to a place where we operate on the listening level and say, God, this is something that's true about you. Cool. I'm going to listen to what you have to say. And this, it looks like this. Every morning, when you wake up, Before you look at your phone or before you think about what you're going to have for breakfast or what you need to do as soon as you wake up, I just want you to wake up, take a moment to breathe, breathe in, breathe out, just nice and slowly. And in the silence, just whisper or say in your mind, good morning, Jesus. Here I am. And then just wait for 30 seconds, 30 seconds. And what I can promise you is that you won't hear anything immediately. You won't. But if you continue to do that every single day, you might find that you can do a minute. And you might find that you can do a minute and a half, and then two minutes, and then three, and then four, and then five, and then six, and then seven, then eight, then nine, then ten. Now, the accumulation of time is not the important thing, but the ability to sit in silence and listen and wait upon the Lord is a powerful thing. Because In many ways, we don't need that much more information or insights into who God is. We just need to believe what we already know about him and bring it into our lives. Mother Teresa had this wonderful thing when she was asked by a journalist, how do you pray? She says, oh, I listen to God. And the journalist said, well, what does he say to you? She says, nothing. He listens to me. And if you can't understand that, then I'm not sure I can explain it any better. (laughs) There's something about listening to God and allowing him and allowing you to just be in the presence of one another. 
that can reframe our lives towards the way of wisdom. And this is the final point that I have way more things to say about. So if you want to hear about it, I will, you can come and talk to me or come this evening. Um, But wisdom is ultimately embodied and found in the person of Jesus. In fact, Lady Wisdom, who is the the kind of the, the image and the metaphor that we see throughout Proverbs, is a metaphor of who Jesus is. And this is the description of Lady Wisdom. Let me find it. Proverbs 9, 1 through 6. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out her seven pillars. She has prepared her food. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. She has sent out her maidens. She calls from the tops of the high places of the city. Whoever is naive, whoever does not know, let him turn, let them turn in here. To they who lack understanding, she says, come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Be with me and eat the food that I have given you and the drink that I have made. Forsake your folly and live and proceed in the way of understanding. So when we listen to God, we enter into the flow of Hochma. We become in deeper relationship with Jesus who transforms us through the inside out through the Holy Spirit and allows us to live into wisdom in a new way. And I love that final line. Come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Come, be with me, feast at my table, feast on who I am. How are you going to know who he is if you haven't listened to what he has to say or been with him long enough to know something more than just inadequate descriptions by people like me with a microphone? I'm out of time. Let's pray. And then we're going to take, I'm going to invite you to take communion together. Why don't we stand? Is that, no, actually, no, let's not do that because then you'll be standing for a really long time. Let's pray. You might want to close your eyes. You might want to put your hands out in front of you. Holy Spirit. Teach us, Lord Jesus, teach us, Spirit, what it means to listen to who you are, to slow down for long enough that we might hear your voice. Or more than that, Lord, that we might experience what it means to simply sit with you in your presence. Lord, the people who, with whom we have the most intimacy in our lives are the people with whom we can spend the most time in silence with. And Lord, we want to grow in intimacy and love with you because your way is the good way. Your wisdom is the wisdom that leads to the good life. No matter how we feel, no matter what we want to do, Lord Jesus, that thing that still remains true, your way is the way. And there may be some of us this morning who are sitting here feeling like I have just not made the right decisions. I have just not made the right decisions over and over and over again. I've chosen to swim against the tide. I've chosen to swim against the way of the Lord and I want to move in his direction. Then Lord, I just want to pray for those people right now that they would know your love. They would hear your voice. They would hear your grace and you would invite them into deeper relationship with you, into forgiveness and healing and a movement towards new life, new creation, new goodness. In Jesus' name, we will say together, amen. Let's take communion.